in the audience know, this is the um, highlight of our uh, annual year, uh, our programs for the year, and we, we so look forward to it. Um, uh, I'm going to turn over the podium to Dr. Dansel Maisie, who's going to moderate the first session, uh, which I'm looking forward to enormously. Dan? Dan? Good morning and welcome to the uh, very few people who are here uh, early. <laughs> um, this is a session on end of, uh, end of life care um, and we're going to have, I'm going to really try to uh, ask my presenters to really keep to their 10 minutes because we'll be set far behind if you don't. Um, so I'll introduce each one uh, sequentially. Our first uh, presenter is uh, uh, Josh Hauser, who's an assistant professor uh, in both the Department of Internal Medicine and the Bueller Center on Aging, Health, and Society at Northwestern University's Feinberg School of Medicine. His interests include inpatient care as well as palliative care and hospice. Um, and uh, he's uh, uh, going to come to the podium now and talk to us about palliative care education at the VA. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Mark. I think this might be Mark's surgical roots starting so early. Um, and welcome to everybody. I want to uh, tell a little bit of a story about a project we've been working on around education and palliative care at the VA system. And I first want to uh, thank a few people. Um, the Department of Veterans Affairs supported this work. and. Amos Bailey, who's a palliative care physician at the Birmingham VA, has been my co-chair in this work. Um, uh, you can see the rest of the team there. And I also want to thank, there are at least two people associated with the McLean Center who were integral to this work as well. Art Dursey uh, and Ellen Fox have also been involved in this project. So here's what I want to do in the next 10 minutes or so. I want to talk about briefly about the history of the education in palliative and end-of-life care, or EPIC program talk about the current state of palliative care at the VA, and talk about the development of this project called EPIC for Veterans. First about the EPIC project. Um, the EPIC project started uh, about 10 years ago um, at the AMA and moved to Northwestern in 2001. It's a train the trainer project um, to teach core competencies in palliative care around symptom management, communication skills, and ethics. And we have about 2,000 trainers who have taken our course, and they in turn have trained about 200,000 end learners. And we accomplish that through a pretty dedicated group of master facilitators who teach each year at our conferences. This is just a, a quick slide of the topics that we teach, and I'm going to return to this in a moment when I talk about the specific uh, VA-centered topics that we've been working on. But you can see basic material in symptom management, communication skills, and ethics. Over the last several years, we have evolved from having a, a core product content to uh, specialty-based curricula, um, oncology, emergency medicine, looking at the overlap of palliative care in those specialties. We have a project in pediatric palliative care that's currently underway. We have a curriculum that was sponsored by the Lance Armstrong Foundation for patients and their family caregivers that focuses on communication skills with your physician and other healthcare professionals. We have international projects, uh, specifically in India and Saudi Arabia. And then we have adaptations for specific populations, and the Veterans Project is an example of that. So let me talk about um, what's going on at the VA in palliative care, um, and then talk about our project. So um, it, it's a nice coincidence that I'm giving this talk uh, the day after Veterans Day, um, which was yesterday, as everybody knows. Um, about a quarter of uh, all deaths in the United States are among veterans. They aren't all within the VA system. In fact, a majority are outside of the VA system. Um, but there are about 20,000 inpatient deaths in the VA system amongst veterans. And you can see on this slide some of the data about those deaths. There are about a quarter in the ICU, and that is slowly decreasing, as you can see on this slide, from 2006 to 2009. Um, and more and more deaths are within hospice beds in the VA. About 60% of patients had a palliative care consultation before deaths in the excuse me, before deaths in the VA. And 
20,000 sounds like a large number. It is a large number to me, but it's, um, it's dwarfed by the number of outpatient deaths uh, that occur in the VA, about 136,000. So a big part of the VA effort in palliative care has been to link with outpatient hospice providers as well. The Comprehensive End-of-Life Care Initiative, or SELC, um, was started by Tom Eads and Scott Shreve uh, at the VA. And education is, is a part of this. You can see it highlighted in yellow, but there are many other uh, parts of this. Um, and and I, as I said, uh, people like Ellen Fox, for example, working in the Integrated Ethics Office have also been a significant part of this. This is an example of uh, how the VA has connected with other care providers and care systems. This is through uh, NHPCO, or the National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization, a campaign called We Honor Veterans. And then in terms of training, our EPIC project is one of three projects. There's a palliative care nurses assistance project and a project for nurses called LNEC. So a word about our, our process. We took um, our core EPIC and EPIC O uh, material and adapted modules to make them more specific to the needs of veterans. We created about five new modules and we also filmed uh, 10 new trigger videos, which are short clinical vignettes in this case of veterans themselves, their family members, and their professional caregivers talking about their experiences. Um, we had almost 100 writers, editors, and reviewers, both within the VA as well as externally. And we ended up with 19 topics. Uh, we had five topics for our plenary sessions, and we had uh, 12 reenacted clinical scenarios from our original EPIC curriculum, as well as 10 new videos um, of veterans, their family members, and their professional caregivers. So I want to show you, Dan has given me the three minute sign, so I'm going to show you about a minute and a half of a video that we uh, filmed with, um, with one of our uh, veterans, and then I'm going to tell you a little bit about who we've taught this curriculum to and some of our next steps. So again, this, this is a video that's designed as a kind of a trigger tape to an educational session that's about the experiences of veterans uh, in World War II. talk about the experience of, um, of marching out of prisoner of war camp and now being in a wheelchair and what that's like uh, 70 years later. 
So again, this is an example of uh, an educational uh, technique that we use at the beginning of uh, a teaching module to elicit conversation and discussion. So let me talk for the last minute about our, our topics, the things that we teach, and how we've implemented this over the past year. So um, our curriculum is divided into roughly three overall groups of topics, communication and goals of care, and you can see examples of that. We have, as is uh, foundational to palliative care, information about symptom management, and you can see examples of that in this slide. And finally, um, more traditional ethics topics, and you can see examples of that in, in this slide. We also, for the, the VA, uh, developed some new material on issues specific to veterans, and uh, PTSD is clearly an issue that has a higher prevalence in veterans' populations than in the general population, and that's an example of material that we developed uh, for this project. We developed experience, materials about the experience of veterans from different war eras and as well about navigating the VA system of care. Let me end with where we are in this project. The, the development process was a, a two-year undertaking. Um, it was uh, punctuated in the middle of that um, by an issue that some of you are familiar with called the death panels. Um, and that delayed us a little bit, um, but we overcame that um, through a lot of hard work with a lot of people. Um, we have now spent the last year teaching two live conferences and trained 260 of our trainers, 126 of whom have taken an extra day of intensive teaching uh, skills work. And we've had 12 webinars in conjunction with both the VA and NHPCO and had over 1,000 attendees at those webinars. We've posted our curriculum on our distance learning platform of the EPIC project, and we have some next steps that we're now interested in doing. So again, our goal was to train all of the palliative care teams at all of the VA facilities, which are about 150 in the United States, as well as to have them train their colleagues. Um, so the next steps in doing that is tracking the people whom we've trained and what they've done. Um, the VA itself has a, a content management system, which is an electronic platform for education, and we're posting our curriculum to that. And then finally, we're developing uh, kits to help uh, with clinical change around family meetings and depression screening. That's where we are. It's a pleasure to be here. I thank you, Mark, and again, I thank you, Dan, for facilitating. Thanks a lot, uh, Josh. That was very uh, illuminating. Our next uh, speaker is Alexia uh, Tork, who's an assistant professor of medicine and geriatrics at the Regenstrife um, uh, Institute, where she's an investigator at the Indiana University School of Medicine. Um, she's also on the faculty of the university's uh, Center for Aging Research and the Fairbanks uh, Center for Clinical Medical Ethics. And Lexi will talk to us about family experiences of healthcare decision making for the hospitalized uh, older adult. Lexi. Thanks, Dan, and thanks to Mark um, for the opportunity to be here today. Um, I, I started with this general title since I submitted it a while back. I'm going to focus today on um, specifically on communication issues within the hospital setting between surrogates and clinicians. I'd like to begin by acknowledging my co-investigators and research staff at IU and the Regan Street Institute. So we know that hospitalized adults 65 and older face major medical decisions in over 50% of hospitalizations, and yet other researchers have found that over 40% of hospitalized adults lack decision-making capacity and require a surrogate. However, surrogate decision-making is really fraught with difficulty. One-third to half of hospitalized families report problems with communication and decision-making, and there's evidence for, for severe distress for many surrogates as measured by PTSD inventories such as the Horowitz scale. Traditional ethical models of surrogate decision-making ask the surrogate to rely on advanced directives and, and to speak for the patient using the standard known as substituted judgment. But we know that surrogates face additional challenges. They have to form their own separate relationships with clinicians, cope with stress and other difficult emotions, and make decisions that could not have been anticipated prior to the acute illness. We and others have proposed that these challenges affect the process and outcomes of decision making, and that coping with these ch challenges depends on the nature of the relationship between the surrogate and the physician. 
A number of other researchers have interviewed surrogates at some point across the period of their decision making and have, under, uh, and have described some key tasks that the surrogate has to undergo in order to make a decision. And for example, sur the surrogate has to understand information, come to terms with the patient illness, and cope with their obligation to the patient. So the surrogate is, is coping with concrete decisions in the midst of a setting of a great deal of kind of psychological and cognitive and emotional tasks. One of these interview studies that I want to mention because it was done by one of the current McLean fellows, Lisa Vig, involved interviewing veterans about their decision-making experience. And she identified some key elements um, that either hinder or facilitate the making of good decisions. And these include surrogate characteristics and life circumstances, surrogate social networks, the relationship between the surrogate and the patient, and then surrogate clinician and communication and relationships. And I'm going to focus on the last of these, particularly in the hospital setting. So the present study was to identify important determinants of successful surrogate clinician communication in the hospital from the surrogate's point of view. And we went about this by developing a conceptual model of communication and decision making and then developing an interview guide based on the model and conducting our interviews. So I'm going to start with our conceptual model. Communication theorists have proposed that there are two fundamental aspects of interpersonal communication, a content dimension that we've called information processing, and a relationship dimension that we've called relationship building. Our model proposes that these two dimensions influence the quality of medical decisions made by surrogates and clinicians, and that these decisions impact outcomes for both patients and surrogates. For each of these major dimensions of the model, we've selected constructs that seem most relevant to surrogate decision making and that are potential candidates for a future intervention. So for information processing, we've identified the process of disclosure, sense making, and expectations on the part of the surrogate, and in relationship building, emotional support, trust, the management of consensus and conflict, and then the roles and the participation of both the clinician and the surrogate. For purposes of today's presentation, I'm going to focus on this left side of the model um, with the elements of communication that play into the surrogate's experience. So to do this study, we, we did this in the context of a prospective observational study of surrogate decision making in two Indianapolis hospitals for adults 65 and older. We identified our patients by doing a physician screen that asks whether the patient has faced any major decisions defined as those addressing life-sustaining therapy, procedures and surgeries, and nursing home placement and then asked whether a surrogate was consulted. <coughs> then we conducted our surrogate interviews, um, which were it, during or as close as possible to the hospitalization in order to capture the, the surrogate's experiences in real time, or two to four months later if the patient had died to allow for acute grief. And these were analyzed using grounded theory. So we, we conducted 35 interviews. As you can see, the majority were female, half were African American and half were white, and the majority of surrogates were daughters, not surprisingly. Um, we identified seven primary themes, and I'm going to talk about these in a little more detail. So the first, the frame of reference. We define the frame of reference as a set of expectations about the hospital experience that guide the surrogate's behavior. These are based on past experiences, such as hospital experiences, life experiences, and even the current hospital experience. So here's a, a woman describing how she and her nieces had to make decisions for her sister. The one thing that they kept pushing, and adamantly pushing, is that we had to make a decision about whether they were going to resuscitate or if anything happened. We just buried their mother on a recent date, and they had to make the same kind of decision for her. The three of us had not even had a time to get through a grieving process before we were faced again with having to make a decision for another family member. So this points out the context in which decision making occurs, is it's often a surrogate who's under, under, under stress already or has other competing family obligations. The frame of reference creates certain expectations about the hospital experience, including how patients and surrogates should be treated, the condition of the hospital, and the behavior of the staff. So here's one describing our county hospital. From my understanding, this is like a county hospital, so everybody comes here. So your length of the time in the emergency room can be lengthy, you know. But for my mom, it wasn't lengthy. They helped her right then and there. This also shows how expectations can be changed um, by novel experiences. Trust and mistrust were really demonstrated by our patients through stories rather than explicit statements. And these stories demonstrate the different levels of trust that the surrogates experience and also different domains in which trust is experienced, such as trust that surrogate will be kept informed or that the clinicians have the patient's best interest at heart. So here's a very mistrustful man describing care of his mother. They have the pain medicine here. It's just a shame that they're reluctant to give it to her because they didn't think they were going to get their money for it. So she had to lay here and suffer the whole time. 
Other participants gained trust by comparing what they were told with what they actually observed. So as this one said, you know, I seen what they were telling me and that it was accurate. Everything was getting better and I was glad of that. Although we and others have framed surrogate clinician relationships as dyadic, our interviews reflect that there may be no identifiable clinician with whom to form a relationship. So here's an example. We usually take her in an emergency room and there's a team of doctors that is caring for her while she's in emergency. Then it's out of their hands and I think they told me because I'm talking to those teams of doctors when I'm there. And once they say she has to stay, then it goes to some other doctors. And the other doctors, the only thing I knew about those was after she called me, Dr. Baker called me, that I knew it was Dr. Baker caring for her. This is actually unique in that the surrogate can identify at least one clinician. <laughs> But we found in many cases that the surrogate couldn't identify anyone, and they actually apologized for this, suggesting that it violated their own expectations for hospital relationships. This second quote also um, kind of is an example of this concept of the relationship with a team and also the surrogate's need for frequent communication. But one thing that I will say is that the staff here, with their having, I believe, three different teams for mom, they were in contact with me on almost like a daily basis. I was extremely impressed that I had gotten so many calls from a team member from W Hospital. So Lord knows who is calling, but at least it's somebody. Finally, the surrogates mentioned the importance of emotional support on a regular basis, such as taking the time out to really sit there with me to explain that to me. That meant a lot to me, because some doctors, they will tell you and explain it to you, and then they move on. But she actually, I felt like she really cared about what was going on with my mom. And finally, many describe the acquisition of information as a struggle. And fortunately, in this day and age, when doctors have pagers, blackberries, and cell phones, at best they're non-communicative and at times unavailable. Information that was kind of shared haphazardly, mainly by the nurses who was saying there was some kind of discussion about some kind of procedure. So to go back to our model, Our findings confirm the importance of several of the key constructs we originally identified, which include information disclosure, sense-making, emotional support. Um, but our findings also deepen our understanding of trust. Um, although the patients may enter the hospital with a baseline level of trust, this can be enhanced or diminished by the hospital experience. Um, specifically, surrogates build trust by comparing their own observations of the patient's care to what they're told by clinicians, um, a process of sense-making, Additionally, trust is built through the act of sharing information and through expressions of emotional support. So really much more of a connection between the information processing and relationship building sides of communication than we had originally thought. So in summary, in the hospital setting, surrogate clinician relationships are often fragmented and brief. Surrogates highly value expressions of emotional support, information, and frequent communication. Um, these decrease the surrogate's distress and increase their trust. And finally, an interdisciplinary approach is accepted by most surrogates. They were happy to be called by a variety of clinicians um, from the medical team. So in conclusion, we need to revise our understanding of relationships between surrogates and clinicians in the hospital setting. In other terms, such as the surrogate physician transaction or Mark's term accommodation may fit better. But emotional, emotional support and trust are possible even within these fragmented relationships. Um, and I think many of you may have experienced this as clinicians, um, where you meet a patient, for example, for the first time on the ward or in the clinic setting, um, and really can establish trust quickly with the right behavior. Surrogates identify elements of communication that are amenable to intervention, and I think this really shows a way forward as far as how we communicate with them in the hospital. However, improving communication with the surrogate will, acquire, will require an additional expenditure of resources, particularly clinician time. And as I, I go through the hospitals talking with the clinicians, it seems to be the, the most scarce resource that they have. So as we consider intervening to improve the surrogate's experience, we need to consider the nature and extent of our obligation to surrogates. Are we obliged to improve the surrogate's communication experience because it'll help the patient, for example, by improving patient outcomes? There's preliminary evidence that this is actually possible, particularly in the ICU setting. Or do we have a separate obligation to family members, such as, a, for example, a public health obligation to improve the experience of the many family members who face life-threatening um, illness in somebody in their family? And these surrogates suffer high levels of distress that appear to be partly due to our failure to communicate effectively for them. So I think the question for the future is about the nature of this obligation and whether, as a healthcare system, we're prepared to fulfill it. Thank you.
Thanks, uh, Lexi, for that uh, wonderful presen uh, presentation and for staying on time. Um, our uh, next uh, presenter is uh, Gretchen uh, Swartz, uh, an assistant professor in the Division of Vascular Surgery at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, she currently runs the ethics curriculum for first, second, and third year medical students at the uh, University of Wisconsin. And her interests lie in clinical ethics and medical decision making, and she will talk about the role of surgeon error in withdrawal of postoperative life support. Thanks so much. Um, I'm just delighted to be invited. And uh, I have to tell you that um, my entire research program started a few years ago at a McLean Fellows Conference when after I spoke about something completely different than what I'm talking about today, Rochelle Bernacki stood up and said, gee, Gretchen, why is it that surgeons have such a hard time withdrawing life-supporting therapy on their patients? Um, and that has really prompted a lot of my um, investigations over the last three years. And I'm going to follow up with some of the data that we have now on surgeons. So um, the first strategy I used to try and figure out the answer to this question, you know, Rochelle was concerned that surgeons were really worried about their outcomes, and that's why they weren't withdrawing life-supporting therapy. And I really felt instinctively that that was actually not the case. And we started just with a qualitative investigation looking at surgeons. And I'm going to present the quantitative data here today, but I want to just briefly um, talk a little bit about what we found in our qualitative investigation. And what we really found is that surgeons felt that um, primarily the reason they weren't withdrawing life-supporting therapy was because they had some sort of agreement that formed preoperatively with the patients, um, which we describe and called surgical buy-in. There was um, a layered interaction that came between the surgeon and the patient formed preoperatively before an operation uh, where they established buy-in. There were some significant contributors to this arrangement, which I'm going to talk mostly about today. And then finally, there were some significant consequences for the stakeholders, primarily this issue of not withdrawing support um, when asked by the surgeon. Um, so today, um, I just wanted to um, follow up on this uh, third thing, the second thing that we found here, which were these contributors to surgical buy-in. And um, this is uh, what surgeons told us and why they uh, felt that they uh, were not going to withdraw support. So the first issue was this issue of personal responsibility for bad outcomes. Like, I made this decision to do it, I'm going to see it through to the end, and that makes it a little harder, at least in my conscience, to throw in the towel, so to speak. The second was an issue of agency, where surgeons really felt that they were the intervention and that they felt that um, by withdrawing support, it was um, showing that they had failed the patient and actually possibly killed the patient. So obviously, you don't want to be the agent you know who kills somebody in the operating room. And that this was a very emotional thing for surgeons. You might feel terrible. You always feel terrible, but you might feel really terrible if it was a completely elective procedure. And then finally, there was an element of um, sort of normative uh, sensibility that um, success was expected because we've been educated to be champions and winners. We've never been educated to recognize the potential of an adverse event. So, um, uh, uh, so while I started with uh, Rochelle's idea about why this is happening, I think um, Bosk really has uh, looked at this in the past, and now I can uh, follow up a little bit more from, uh, from his investigation. And, um, really, this issue of error and responsibility, I think, has significant implications for our surgical patients. Um, and Boss says it so well. When a patient of an internist dies, his colleagues ask, what happened? And when the patient of a surgeon dies, his colleagues ask, what did you do? And I think that this is what we're confronting when we talk to surgeons postoperatively who are having such a hard time withdrawing life-supporting therapy. So I um, did a quantitative investigation, a national survey of physicians. We interviewed um, vascular, cardiothoracic, and neurosurgeons, primarily because they were homogeneous in the um, fact that they performed many high-risk operations. And um, we wanted to make sure that the people we sampled uh, were having to face these decisions about with withdrawing life-supporting therapy. It was an incentivized male-based survey, and we had uh, 23 questions based on the results from our qualitative study. Um, we did some cognitive interviewing, and um, primarily um, the results I'm going to show you today are based on a vignette. Um, and our hypothesis in the vignette was that surgeons are less likely to withdraw life-supporting therapy in the setting of an elective operation when the complication is clearly the result of a surgeon error. And the vignette is briefly as follows. A 75-year-old woman who has an operation, and we tailored the operation to the specialty of the physician who received the questionnaire. 
Um, the operation occurs, and on post-operative day seven, she has had um, a very severe uh, hemiplegic stroke, and she's been reintubated twice for a post-operative pneumonia. And we asked the surgeon, um, and the patient has decision-making capacity and says that she wants to withdraw life-supporting therapy, and we asked the surgeon, what would you do? Um, and they get uh, three uh, uh, non uh, possible options. One is to withdraw at the patient's request. The second is to wait uh, three days and see how things go. And the third is to wait uh, an additional uh, seven days to see how the patient uh, does. So we used a two by two factorial design uh, where we experimentally manipulated the vignette per, uh, in each uh, um, survey. Uh, we had uh, the elective setting so some surgeons had an elective procedure where there was clearly a surgeon error. Some surgeons received an emergent operation where there was surgeon error. And then we had not clearly surgeon error. So we didn't specifically divide, define the complication as a result of surgeon error and went with the elective and emergency cases. Here's our design. You can see the vascular surgeons got a thoracoabdominal aneurysm. In the emergent setting, it was ruptured. The cardiac surgeons got an ascending aneurysm. And the neurosurgeons got a um, uh, a intracranial aneurysm. So um, uh, our results, uh, we were fairly happy uh, that we had uh, 900 <laughs> surgeons respond to our uh, survey, um, which ended up being a, an adjusted response rate of 55%. Um, as you can see, our surgeons were primarily male, but um, these are the patients, uh, the respondents who withdrew life-supporting therapy. And you can see at the patient's request, um, uh, that it's about 40% of surgeons who would honor that request to withdraw life-supporting therapy on post-operative day seven. And you can see that this is uh, uh, different uh, depending on the surgeon's subspecialty. So the cardiac surgeons were actually much less likely than the vascular surgeons to withdraw support. And um, the other thing is uh, that this really depended on our vignette. So that surgeons who um, were told that they uh, had made an error in the operating room um, were much less likely to withdraw support than surgeons who were not told that the complication was a result of the error. And also, um, the same happened with elective versus an emergency operation. And um, the, um, the emergence of the two uh, clinical scenarios together actually produced uh, fairly uh, predictable results. Excuse me. Um, and you can see that surgeons who had an elective case um, in the uh, and committed an error um, were much less likely than so those surgeons who received an emergency operation um, and the error was not clearly defined as theirs. Um, we asked about factors that might impact their decisions to withdraw life-supporting therapy, and these factors came primarily out of our qualitative study. And the factors that were really significant were the factors such as uh, personal optimism about the patient's future quality of life, um, feelings about the morality of withdrawing life supporting therapy, and also sort of a very paternalistic um, uh, attitude that the patient was unable to accurate, accurately predict the value of her future health state. Um, we we're also interested in this issue of performance measure, measures and outcomes profiling, and we found that this did not have an impact on whether the surgeon was will, willing to withdraw life supporting therapy. And then finally, the results for the most part held on our multivariate analysis, where um, not surprisingly, the uh, vignette um, uh, did have a significant impact on surgeons' willingness to withdraw. So surgeons who uh, had an emergency operation that was not clearly, the complication was not clearly the result of surgeon error, uh, were twice as likely to withdraw life-supporting therapy than those uh, in the elective setting. So in conclusion, surgeons are less likely to withdraw life-supporting therapy post-operatively in elective cases when the surgeon has made a technical error, and that the decision to, uh, to withdraw or not withdraw is associated with optimism about the patient's prognosis and concern that the patient cannot predict the value of her future health state. I think there's some significant ethical concerns here. Um, one is the emotional strain for surgeons. I think that this error of um, this um, emotional uh, problem of error and responsibility for outcomes uh, really does impact how we uh, take care of our patients postoperatively. Um, and I think that um, while this uh, feeling of responsibility is very important, it clearly has some significant side effects. So if there is a way that we can simultaneously respect the fierce ethic of responsibility for, uh, that surgeons have for their patients, but also to be able to um, step back a little bit and respect patients' autonomy, particularly in the setting of a bad outcome, um, 
that this would be uh, something that uh, we could have um, uh, uh, a, an outcome that it more closely reflects patient preferences. preferences. And then finally, the, there's this question of what is the right operative mortality rate? And um, the performance of an operation in order to prove quality of life or save a life is certainly valuable to patients and their families, but it should be valuable even if the patient doesn't survive. And I think that this is something with, that within the surgical community is something very hard to stomach, um, but should be something that um, is valued and treated as an important thing of part, part of surgical care. Um, so I think uh, thinking a little bit more about normative behavior in our culture, um, this would be a nice thing to be able to intervene on. Thank you very much. Thank you again for a uh, very interesting presentation, wonderful data. Um, the uh, next uh, presentation will be by uh, James Kirkpatrick, who is an assistant professor of medicine at the University of Pennsylvania and a member of the Cardiovascular Institute there. His research expertise um, is in cardiovascular medical ethics and conflicts of interest. He's also a volunteer physician at the Esperanza Health Clinic in Philadelphia, and James is going to talk to us about a different way of going green. Uh, the reuse of pacemakers. Well, thank you to Mark and the McLeans and to Dan for the opportunity to present something that will be actually quite a bit different than what we've heard already. Uh, here's my disclosure set. I have no relevant disclosures, no industry affiliations. Well, to set the context for this, I think it's important to understand, as a cardiologist, I can say we're number one. We are number one in deaths in the world. Our cardiovascular disease is basically, as you know, the number one killer in the Western world, but it's fast approaching the number one status in the rest of the world as well. The cardiovascular disease burden in lower and middle income countries is going to increase by 137% over a 30-year period. And that means about 14 million cardiovascular deaths per year. You can see from this graph that the number of deaths is actually much greater from cardiovascular disease in the developing world than it is in the Western world, and that's only going to get worse. What I think is particularly bad is that cardiovascular disease strikes patients at a younger age in the developing world, and even if they don't die from it, they can very much be debilitated. This leads to really economic implications for patients' families and also for the society in general. Now, in addition to all of the diseases that we are actively exporting as we export cigarettes and unhealthy lifestyle to the rest of the world, the fact is that there are a number of diseases in developing world countries that affect the heart that are specific to those countries, Chagas disease being one of them, which uh, is caused by this protozoa and transmitted by the reduvid or kissing bug, so mentioned because it uh, tends to bite people around the lips at night. This can cause heart electrical conduction block treated with pacemakers, lethal arrhythmias, which can be treated with defibrillators, and cardiomyopathy or failing heart, uh, which can be treated with a special kind of pacemaker and a defibrillator. Sudden unexplained death syndrome is the number one cause of sudden death, or, or death in general, in young, healthy Southeast Asian males. There is a high risk of recurrence if you happen to survive the first lethal arrhythmia. And there actually was a randomized controlled trial published in 2003 demonstrating that defibrillators were better than a medicine called a beta blocker in preventing this recurrence. So not surprisingly, there are disparities in implants of pacemakers, and I have to make one correction, the size not per year. Um, there are 450 million uh, pacemakers per million population in basically every Western country, and the U.S., of course, is number one in that. But compare this to the rest of the world, South Africa at 54 per million, Thailand 22, Peru, and in Bangladesh, they only have four pacemakers per million population. Why is this? Obviously, it's because of the cost. The pulse generator is that little thing that you feel underneath the skin, uh, and that's the thing that houses the battery and the, the pulse generation uh, that paces the heart, and that's a pretty expensive device. The leads which connect that pulse generator to the heart can also be expensive, and defibrillators are much more expensive than that. And when you compare it to the fact that the average uh, person in Bolivia makes between $50 and $100 a month, it's just not going to happen for them if they need one of these devices, especially because these countries appropriately want to focus their health care money on prevention, not on expensive devices. So there actually are ways to get a device if you are a poor person in, an, in a lower and middle income country. Uh, the companies that make these devices can only keep them on the shelf for about 12 to 18 months, and then the, both the sterility and the battery life can no longer be said to be the equivalent to a new device. 
So they donate these expired devices and they are implanted overseas. In addition, we can get devices that have been used. And I want to talk specifically about getting post-mortem devices. There are cases in which you take a device out when you need to upgrade the device, say from a pacemaker to a defibrillator, but I want to focus on the latter point. There is a precedent for this. It turns out that in the early 1990s, Sweden used 14% of you reuse devices in 14% of their primary implants. Now, in 1996, they had incorporated into the European common market and had to follow those rules, and so they stopped doing it. But many in Sweden felt that this was, was a, a tragedy, actually. And it turns out that there are a number of uh, charity organizations in the United States that have been doing this for a long time. They collect used devices, and they send them overseas and implant them. And one of the reasons they can do this is that devices have to be removed prior to cremation. They will explode in the crematorium chamber and damage it. So all morticians know how to take these devices out. And because cremation rates are expected to reach 59% of deaths in the United States by 2025, this may have a potential for being a lot of devices that get taken out. These devices can be cleaned. This is actually a sterilization uh, protocol that was used in Sweden in some of their trials. And I would argue that, there, that because of all this, there is a significant supply. Uh, pacemaker patients, in general, tend not to survive that long, and some of this is for from comorbidity reasons, but sometimes it's because they're just plain old. Patients who are, are greater than 80 make up 32% of the implants in the United States, so they are, their longevity is not going to outlast the pacemaker in many cases. Even if you want to say that, you know, after you want to send the device back because it, it fails within four years and and consider the warranty issues, that's still six years left on a pacemaker. So it's not uncommon that this happens. The cartoon says his pacemaker is lasting longer than he did. This is a joke, but it's, it's really true. This is what happens. And these devices actually have a fair amount of battery life left. There's an organization uh, started at the University of Michigan which collects used devices from funeral homes, and they reported on 2,000 devices that were donated to them. They found that 10% had greater than 75% battery life left or it would last at least four years. And interestingly, again, the average time since implant to when they received it, having been taken out of a dead patient, was only two years. So when we looked at this, we actually found, when we asked uh, uh, morticians what they did with these devices that they took out, we found that the highest percentage reported that they just threw them away. There were some that uh, donated them from, for reuse overseas. This is how I first found out about it. Uh, and then these other uh, things that you can actually do, including donating to uh, veterinary hospitals for reuse in racehorses and, and dogs. So when we actually asked patients whether they would be willing to donate devices, uh, of the patients who said they'd be willing to sign an advanced directive that authorized uh, reuse of their pacemakers afterwards, uh, oh, I'm sorry, this is our data on when we actually asked electrophysiologists um, what they did with the devices. We found a similar uh, thing, that very few of them actually donated devices for reuse overseas, and most of them actually threw away greater than 10 devices per year. A lot of them, as you can see, just kept them around in the lab or the office. So here's actually where we asked the patients about that, and of the patients that were willing to sign advanced directive saying what they wanted done after they died with their device, you can see the vast majority said they'd be just fine with donating them for reuse overseas. But we felt that there were still some ethical and legal and logistical problems that were still uh, involved here and that we needed to actually address these. And in particular, these are the barriers we thought that were most important. And you can see they really uh, have to do with non-maleficence, some legal issues, and then these competing interest issues as well. So it turns out when we actually looked at the five trials that compared new devices and old devices, these were not randomized trials, um, that there really was no difference in infections that were reported. Now you can argue about the follow-up time and, and the detectability of infections, but the reality was in the data that we have, there was no difference in infections. And the malfunctions, although there were some more malfunctions reported in these uh, trials uh, in the reused devices, it turned out when you looked at them carefully, the reported ones really had more to do with the implant technique than actual failure of the device itself. So here's actually the, the uh, advanced directive that we uh, published um, dealing with pacemaker and defibrillator reuse and allowing patients to actually authorize this after uh, they died and the pacemaker was removed. And specifically, we give patients options, what can be done with the device, because that's the biggest problem, people don't know. 
information about where to donate it, and if they want to return it to the manufacturers, uh, they can certainly do that. Appointment of a surrogate to decide, and then deactivation at the end of life, which is another uh, area of interest that people need to make plans for that as well. Now, one of the big issues here, ethically, is the competing interest of post-marketing surveillance. Uh, there have been a number, as you're probably aware, of uh, device recalls and problems uh, in devices that were discovered upon analysis of these devices, which were returned to the company for, quote-unquote, bench analysis, take the device apart and find a problem with it. And it could be, in fact, that, uh, that uh, devices that basically are taken out of patients after they die uh, may have more errors than those that are returned after they get an upgrade of their device or change out for battery depletion. And so the Heart Rhythm Society and others have recommended that all devices be returned to the manufacturers after they're taken out of patients. But I would argue that uh, rather if devices with inadequate battery life are sent back to manufacturers and the ones with adequate battery life are sent overseas, that still represents a lot of devices that they can analyze. And if the public gets interested in this idea of returning them overseas, you're actually going to increase the number of devices that go back to the manufacturers. So when we argue this issue also, and saying that basically this issue of uh, saying the best may not be, uh, may be the enemy of the good in this particular case, we uh, drew on a, a quote by Peter Singer in a, a famous article from 1972, Famine, Affluence, and Morality. He said, suffering and death from lack of food, shelter, and medical care are bad, and if it's in our power to present, prevent something bad from happening without sacrificing anything of comparable moral importance, we ought to do it, and, and we would argue that this applies to the reuse of pacemakers. Suffering from a lack of pacemaker is bad, and it is within our power to do something about it, and therefore we ought to do it. So in conclusion, I think that there is a need. There certainly is a supply. I believe that there is an ethical pathway to this, and next we need more safety data. Uh, we would like the FDA, which currently considers reuse of pacemakers, at least in the United States, to be a quote-unquote morally objectionable practice, uh, to officially at least say it's okay to reuse these overseas. And then it raises this issue of domestic reuse, which is another talk. So I want to uh, uh, recognize the other people who have worked at this from Penn, uh, University of Chicago, and also the University of Michigan, and thank you for your time. Thank you, James. W wonderful and interesting. Um, our last presenter for the panel uh, uh, this morning is Lynn Jansen, who is the Madeline Brill Nelson Chair in Ethics Education and Associate Professor of Medicine at Oregon Health and Science uh, University Center for Ethics and Healthcare. She has extensive experience teaching medical students and healthcare professionals about ethical issues challenging today's uh, uh, practitioners. Lynn? Thank She's you. going to talk, I'm sorry, about the problems with optimism in clinical trials. All right, thanks, Dan. Thanks, Dr. Siegler, for inviting me uh, to present our research today. Um, in the brief time that I have, I'm just going to discuss a uh, very um, overview of uh, findings from a study that we completed and published in IRB um, in January. And then I'm going to just end by saying a word or two about the ethical significance of our research. Um, as many of you uh, already know, there's been really quite a lot of academic discussion about the so-called therapeutic error in early phase oncology trials. The therapeutic error occurs when a research participant falsely believes that um, participating in a clinical trial will provide her with a direct therapeutic benefit. It's widely recognized that this therapeutic error has the potential to undermine the moral validity of consent to participate in research. However, I think it's necessary to describe correctly the nature and cause of this error in order to appreciate how it actually impacts on informed consent, if it does so at all. So in the main, uh, the existing research on this issue has focused on the ways in which misunderstandings about the nature or benefits of research can cause subjects to commit the therapeutic error. Yet interestingly, uh, studies have also shown that the therapeutic error uh, persists even after these misunderstandings have been corrected. This is interesting because these findings actually strongly suggest that the cause of the therapeutic error include more than simple deficits in understanding. So with this in mind, I and my research team pursued an alternative explanation for the therapeutic error. 
The central hypothesis of our study, which was an R21 pilot study funded by the National Cancer Institute, was that participants in early phase oncology trials exhibit unrealistic optimism in their assessment of their susceptibility to risks and benefits associated with participating in those trials. Now, and actually this is a really important point to grasp, um, unrealistic optimism is not simply a state of mind. So it's not the same thing as mere hopefulness or even excessive hopefulness. Rather, it's a bias, it's a form of irrationality, if you will. Uh, that leads a person to believe that she is less likely to experience negative out outcomes and or more likely to experience positive outcomes than others who are similarly situated to her. And in fact, research in social psychology has shown that unrealistic optimism is quite prevalent in human um, psychology and in motivating human behavior. Uh, it's been shown to influence judgments about risks and benefits in a wide range of different contexts, from the belief that one won't get HIV from engaging in unprotected sex, to the belief that one can dodge all of the health risks associated with smoking. However, nobody um, actually explored whether unrealistic optimism might influence assessments of research-related risks and benefits in the context of early phase oncology trials. So the principal objective of our study, accordingly, was to understand the prevalence and magnitude of unrealistic optimism among individuals who were enrolled in early phase oncology trials. And to pursue this objective, we gathered data on how patients enrolled in these trials comparatively assessed their susceptibility to uh, specific research-related uh, risks and benefits. And, and we, we employed the uh, comparative risk-benefit assessment form in order to achieve this objective. And this is actually the very standard instrument that's used uh, for measuring unrealistic optimism, and it was developed by the social psychologist Dr. Neil Weinstein, who was also a member of our research team. So we asked um, 72 uh, patient subjects in early phase oncology trials to complete this questionnaire, but because it's a comparative questionnaire, we needed to give them a frame of reference for making an, an accurate comparison. So prior to uh, asking them to respond to these questions, we um, asked them to take in mind the following description um, of the average cancer patient who's enrolled in an early phase oncology trial. So we, we, we told them that an average cancer patient who enrolls in an early phase oncology trial uh, is, a, is someone who's already tried at least one, but perhaps several kinds of therapies, and these therapies have failed to control his or her cancer. So with this reference in mind, subjects were asked then to rate how they compared with other patients enrolled in the same uh, early phase oncology trial in which they were enrolled to compare themselves um, with respect to all of these questions and um, rate themselves on the seven-point scale, ranging from negative three, much below average, to three, much above average, with zero being um, average. And as this slide um, indicates, we actually found significant levels of unrealistic optimism with respect to three of the five research-related questions. In particular, our data revealed that patient subjects exhibit unrealistic optimism when asked about the possibility of their cancer being controlled by the drugs administered in the trial, their possibility of experiencing health benefits from participating in the trial, and not experiencing health problems from the drugs administered in the trial. Now, before I go on to discuss the ethical implications of our, uh, our study, I, I need to just mention one further um, feature of the study, and that is that in addition to asking the, the comparative risk-benefit assessment questionnaire, we asked patients to complete uh, what we called a purpose question. And this was just simply an open-ended question where we asked the patient subject, what is your understanding of the purpose of the trial in which you were enrolled? And the purpose question, um, in, in responding to this pur purpose question, uh, we found actually no significant relationship between the patient subject's understanding of the purpose of the trial in which they're enrolled and, as measured by that question and their degree of unrealistic optimism as measured by the um, comparative risk-benefit questionnaire. In fact, uh, nearly three-fourths of the respondents indicated correctly uh, that the purpose of the trial in which they were enrolled was to generate generalizable scientific knowledge that had the potential to benefit future patients. Um, 
So this is an interesting finding, I think, because it, it suggests that unrealistic optimism is not a product of a misunderstanding, or at least not a simple misunderstanding about the nature of clinical research. Um, so it provides us with a further reason for thinking that unrealistic optimism is an independent explanation for the persistence of this therapeutic error, something different going beyond the uh, uh, therapeutic misunderstanding that we spent the last 20 years studying. Um, now, of course, our findings are preliminary. Um, they need to be corroborated by further research looking at a more diverse population, and it would also be good to, to look at patient subjects with a broader range of malignancies. Um, but assuming that the preliminary findings are confirmed, it will become important to think about what the ethical significance of unrealistic optimism in cancer research might be. And on this issue, I actually have quite a lot to say, but given the time constraints, um, I'm going to be very brief. Um, recall that I said that unrealistic optimism is a bias, and as such, it can interfere with um, a rational processing of our, the information that, that, that's given to us. Um, but the way in which it interferes um, with the processing of information actually has interesting and largely unexplored implications for informed consent. And here's how. Biases in general do not compromise the understanding element of informed consent. We sort of had the beginning of showing that with a purpose question, but this has actually been demonstrated in other contexts. Um, but biases do, in fact, interfere with how information gets processed by the person. And when you look outside of the context of clinical research, researchers have found, for example, that smokers, um, who are also unrealistically optimistic, that they're not misunderstanding the relevant facts about the dangers of smoking, not at all. Their mistake is um, in how they apply that information and those facts to themselves. So taking that same uh, information into the context of research, we, we, we begin to think that if we want to combat unrealistic optimism among trials in trial subjects, what we're going to need to do is provide them with more than simply more information. We're going to need to develop in, uh, interventions that may help to improve their appreciation and processing of the information that we give them. And let me just call attention to, to one further factor about the um, unrealistic optimism that, that hints at its ethical relevance. Um, and this is how biases actually operate. Uh, typically, biases operate behind our backs. It is we're not aware that we are under the, the, the grip of a bias. Um, and because they operate behind our back and without our awareness, they pose a threat to our autonomy. Um, interestingly, the traditional model of informed consent that we use in research doesn't actually do very well in identifying threats to autonomy that aren't simply the product of coercion or misunderstanding. So if we start to think that um, these biases are in, uh, in operation, and as we learn more about the factors that distort our rational judgment, factors like unrealistic optimism, we may need, in fact, to revise and broaden the model of informed consent that we use in clinical research. Now, many people will say that there's actually nothing wrong with optimism. They're going to say, if cancer patients and oncology trials have hope, then that's a good thing, and well, we sh should not take it away from them. And in general, I think that's probably right. Um, but I think our research is important because it challenges researchers to think a little bit more deeply about optimism than we have been doing in the past. It suggests that in cancer patients, um, optimism just shouldn't always be, by default, assigned with a hopeful state of mind. Um, Optimism is actually a much more complex phenomenon. It certainly can be ethically benign, but it also can be a bias that distorts rational decision making. And when it does distort rational decision making, it becomes ethically troubling. Thank you. Oh, and these are, these are the people on my study. <laughs> All right. I'd invite the uh, panelists up to the uh, podium. And the uh, uh, paper session is now um, open for questions. And um, again, I thank you for staying relatively on time that we actually have, uh, above the schedule, 11 minutes for questions. Fascinating project. I mean, it's such a practical impact uh, if this thing can continue to develop. And I was thinking about one of, uh, you know, ways of pushing toward more devices being recovered and used in this way. Monsanto, the agri-giant, uh, has created a soybean that's used virtually everywhere now that you not only have to buy the seed from them, but you're not allowed to use the seed that's developed when you grow the soybean. And I wonder if you might look into having insurance companies roll out uh, a plan in which when people are going to get a device, they pay a lower co-payment of some sort 
if they agree that the device belongs still to the insurance company after their death, and that it could be recovered and used in a kind of systematic or in a well-developed way that could be recovered and, and turned around. Yeah, that's a very interesting uh, idea, and it involves both the issues of who owns the device, which I think pretty much we can assume is the patient. Interestingly, in Sweden, the Swedish government felt that they owned the device, and so it went back to them every time, and then they would reuse it. Uh, so you could make that argument even from a public health standpoint if, if we were going to reuse them. Um, and I, I like this idea, actually, of, of allowing patients a, a reduction in copay to actually have their devices reused. The big barriers to this, the, the first barrier is the FDA. They really hate this idea. They think it's awful um, and have, have really maintained this for a long time, mostly concerns of, of infection transmission. The other is the device companies. Um, they're, they're really not interested in the reuse of their devices at all. Um, so, but but this, that's a very interesting idea and, and a way that perhaps the insurance companies at least would, would potentially get behind this, seeing the cost savings. We do have some initial sort of calculation data estimating about $84 million could be saved each year if we reused approximately 10% of devices, which is kind of similar to what the Swedes were doing. I work with cancer patients doing clinical trials. I'm in palliative care, and so I've observed what you describe. Um, but my question is, I think that there's a way in which in our society we've sort of cultivated this idea, where we've, we've promulgated this idea that cultivating optimism is, is a strategy to have better outcomes. So patients have, have this belief, and I think a lot of physicians and others in society share this belief, that if the more optimistic I am, the better my outcomes are likely to be. And so actually cultivating optimism is almost a strategy uh, for better outcomes. Now, I don't know if there's any evidence to support that. I know that there is lots of belief in that, or that's my impression. So do you think that it's, that, that, that I mean, to me that complicates the issue I mean, if, we, if, if there's evidence that, in fact, being optimistic and hopeful improves your outcomes, then we certainly don't want to discourage that. If the evidence is contrary, then it becomes an issue. Can you address that? Sure. Um, that, that's right. So, in fact, it is the case that um, what, what psychologists refer to as dispositional optimism, which is just the general happy, rosy outlook on life, um, is something we can cultivate and is something that has been shown to uh, lead to improved outcomes in a lot of different healthcare situations. I mean, um, it, greater, uh, faster recovery from coronary artery bypass surgery and so on and so on. So you can actually find data to support that claim. But it's really important to distinguish dispositional optimism, which is what would be, um, I think, what you're talking about, from unrealistic optimism, which is itself a situation-specific bias. Uh, it's an event-specific, situation-specific bias. So it's not, um, it's not something that even one, one can cultivate because one's not even aware that one has it, right? And that actually um, has, uh, it, that doesn't lead uh, to um, better outcomes. In fact, the, the examples that I w was giving to you um, suggested that it leads people to um, engage in more riskier behavior um, all around the board, for ris take risks that would endanger their health um, and, their, and their safety. So, so, the, so the key there is to, um, to keep that distinction in, in focus, and, and certainly we don't want to dis, dis, uh, discourage somebody's dispositional optimism, but we need to be mindful of the fact that unrealistic optimism is a real force that can undermine, undermine rational uh, processing of information. Is that? Yeah, thank you. Ryan Nash from UAB. Thank you all for excellent presentations. I do, too, have questions for all of you, but I'll, if I can, limit myself to two short ones. The first for Lynn. Um, the, uh, one of my favorite coffee mugs is, says, I hear you, I just disagree. Um, and I wonder, I agree with you, um, but I, I, I wonder <laughs> um, in this, how much is trust related to this bias of unrealistic optimism in that I, I, I've heard it said by patients, I know the oncologist said that this isn't curable, but I just disagree with them. Um, it, so how much of it is, a, uh, do we know whether a trust in, in medicine is related to this unrealistic bio, uh, optimism? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting question. Um, I know that, um, I know f for certain that there are certain factors that, um, 
that evoke the bias. And I know for certain that in our study we found, uh, for example, uh, the sense of controllability uh, on the part of the, 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 the respondent uh, was correlated with, with the bias. Um, but what you're as asking uh, seems to be uh, something different, the, uh, the relationship of trust that the person experiences with his or her physician, is that um, going to have any relationship in evoking the bias? And I, I don't know the answer to the question. I mean, it's possible that, you know, it's possible that lots of things, you know, the, the optimistic bias works in tandem with the therapeutic misconception and, and, or, and different things like that are going on. So I don't know the answer to the question. I haven't studied it, but it's an interesting question. And Gretchen, the, um, in my experience, I think I, uh, one of the reasons that my surgeons at UAB, um, at least the trainees, were very uncomfortable with, uh, um, withdrawal, with compassionate extubation, for, ex for example, um, was that their experience was one of two things. They either had seen um, an order written extubate patient and move to the next room and patient dies like a fish out of water, or they had seen um, orders for massive doses of medication the patient never breathes as they come off the ventilator. And I wonder if the lack of good experience, um, I mean, surgeons being experiential learners, I mean, they, they want to do and they want to see it done well, um, I wonder how much the lack of experience of doing these things in, in training may um, bring reluctance that if they could see it done well, that there is a tertium quid before, I mean, there is a third option between these two poles, um, could bring um, a greater acceptance. Yeah, um, you know, we didn't ask that specifically because we didn't find that in our qualitative study. We were really reliant on the things that we had found to validate in our quantitative piece. Um, you know, but we did find a lot of issues of conflict with um, ICU providers, either uh, nurses and ICU physicians. And I think that suggests that um, the surgeon, regardless of how they feel about extubation or palliative care, um, actually just had a completely different idea about what the appropriate course of therapy was, so that the surgeon has a different goal, and the intensive care unit team, who may be able to provide much better palliative therapy at that point, um, had a different goal as well. And so um, I, I don't think that that would necessarily get us to a better point with surgeons. I think the issue is um, much more um, it, it's deeper inside the surgeon than that. It's sort of, I got them here, and it's now my duty to get them out. And because it's my responsibility, I can't possibly abide by these wishes to change our goals of therapy. Right. I actually am not going to ask a question, but I, I want to congratulate the panelists, uh, as a, uh, each of you, uh, for, for really extraordinary presentations. It, it spoke to me about um, uh, the range of, of the field of clinical ethics, and, and also about its maturing. Um, I mean, your ability to get up and talk ranging from uh, end-of-life decisions affecting a quarter of a million uh, people who have been trained to surrogate decision-making, which will emerge increasingly as an important method of decision-making for an aging population and a sicker population. Uh, the interventions that Gretchen is talking about in surgical decision-making so important. James's points about uh, helping to, to meet the needs of the poor, either in this country or in the third world, um, and, and Lynn's work on phase one research, which is so important as, as we go forward uh, with scientific developments. Uh, I, mean, I mean, it speaks to, 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 to this combination of the normative with the empiric and to the range of issues that we're addressing. I, I, th I thought each of the presentations was absolutely superb, and I want to thank you and, and Dan for moderating it, really. Preston, please, and identify yourself. Uh, Preston Reynolds at University of Virginia, and I also want to echo Mark's comments. This was really a superb panel, um, and compliments to all of you guys. Alexia, um, surrogate decision-making. I was just fascinated with the fact that surrogates could hardly identify one care provider. Is there any data that you've collected that care providers, physicians, are often confused as to who the surrogate decision maker? And so it's a sea of people that are in a room, who is a surrogate decision maker? And so therefore, how is the relationship going to get constructed when there's confusion on both sides? 
I, I think that's absolutely true. Is that the, the the number, the large number of people is certainly not one-sided. Um, you know, I think, honestly, I think there are many physicians in practice who really advocate both for the naming of a, a single surrogate through um, healthcare durable powers of attorney, um, or sometimes pressure a family to identify a single decision maker. And I would say that this is successful in a majority of cases, but there are times when it's not. Um, and I, I mean, I would advocate, this is a little bit kind of off the map, but I would advocate that there are times when it's actually appropriate to rely on the family consensus whenever possible. So I think kind of resorting to hierarchies is a last resort when you can get multiple family members in a room and come to agreement, that's the ideal. Um, well, when there's multiple children, it's actually... Yes. Okay, we've got to uh, keep moving on. Two, last two questions, one from Shola, one from Laney. Shola. Shola Olopati from Chicago. Great presentation by everyone, but my question is for Jim. Uh, if those uh, pacemakers are good and reusable uh, in the developing uh, settings where we're dealing with uh, poor people, uh, what are the impediments to actually using them here? Uh, because uh, we're talking about the uh, health care cost, you know, being unsustainable. If they're good out there, why can't they be uh, used there? Can you highlight some of the local impediments to that? Yeah, that, that's really kind of our uh, another issue that we're trying to deal with, trying to get a paper in right now. None of the cardiology journals seem to want that for some reason. But um, So the, the biggest thing really is the FDA. The FDA uh, feels that it's unsafe. A, a pacemaker is considered a single-use device. Um, you can reprocess single-use devices. We do it all the time already, dialysis catheters and, and other, or dialysis uh, 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 filters and all those sorts, many different types of catheters. Um, the problem is a lot of the data was old and it was done overseas. So the FDA, before they would even consider something to be reused in the United States, would need modern data in the modern era, randomized controlled trials, and preferably done in the United States. Um, the problem is, in order to do such a trial like that, you, it would be very expensive unless the device companies actually donate their new devices for it, which they're not going to do <coughs> in this setting. So um, I, I think that as the healthcare crisis, healthcare financing gets worse and worse. There will be more consideration of, of things like this going on. But at the moment, these are really big uh, options. And as, as Mark pointed out, and as, as we've discussed with others too, if we start reusing them locally, does that mean that there will be fewer devices to use overseas? And there's a huge ethical issue there. Are we stealing from the poor to give to the rich, in a sense? So I think we're going to have to work all of that out as, as we go forward. But that's a, that's a very good point, and there is a potential cost savings there. Laney, last question. Yes, yes. <clears throat> Laney Ross, University of Chicago. Thank you all for a great panel. So I have a comment and then a question for Lexi. The, um, so the first was when you suggested changing the word relationship to transaction. I want to say just say no. Um, <laughs> Jerome Groupman just had a lovely article about a month ago in the New England Journal where he bemoaned the fact that we've moved from physicians and patients to providers and clients. And I think the word transaction fits in that same model. Um, we want it to be a relationship, even if it's a temporary one. The, uh, the question is, pediatrics, we deal with two surrogates all the time. It's called mom and dad. And so what lessons can you guys learn from the pediatricians? <laughs> Man. <laughs> I think the, the um, primary problem is that the entire model of adult decision making is, has been so focused on an autonomous patient that we have yet to fully consider what decision making is like when the patient's autonomy is limited. And, and so we have a lot to learn from the pediatricians um, about how, how to make decisions um, in that context. Um, and I, I think particularly, and I may have spoken about this at other times, and, and so and others have written on this, that the issue of um, trying so hard to use autonomy as our primary guiding principle for surrogate decision making is in many ways misguided. And I think if we could, what we could learn from the pediatricians is that there are multiple competing concerns. They include not only um, you know the child's wishes, the child's best interests, and even perhaps the other wish, the wishes and needs of the other members of the family. Um, so I think we could move a bit more towards the model of pediatric decision making, um, and that would, moving away from autonomy a bit towards a balancing of, of competing um, interests would actually be a, a positive thing for adult decision making. Great. Well, let me uh, uh, conclude by echoing uh, Mark's uh, comments, thanking the, the panelists. I mean, I think we all um, appreciate that this was a, a 
five creative, interesting, and important projects done by five very smart and talented uh, former uh, McLean fellows. So thank you, thank you all very much. Thank you. The next portion of our program um, is really the highlight of the program. Um, uh, it, it, it's the, the awarding um, of, of a new prize that the McLean Center uh, has developed uh, just this year. Um, the, uh, the award presentation will be made by um, Dean Kenneth Polanski, um, who um, is a dear friend uh, of 30 years, um, who returned to the University of Chicago uh, after 11 years at Wash U as the chairman of medicine to take over the deanship uh, at the University of Chicago in 2010. It's a delight and pleasure to introduce you to Dean Kenneth Polanski. Well, thank you, Mark. This has been a really uh, wonderful occasion. It's, uh, I was here yesterday. I really enjoyed the uh, session uh, this morning, and you're to be congratulated with the outstanding program that you put on, and I think the uh, uh, Mark and I were colleagues and friends uh, at the inception of the McLean Center, and I don't think that anyone could have imagined uh, the success that it has enjoyed over this 23 years. So I think that that's really a fantastic accomplishment, and it's really delightful that uh, Barry and Mary Ann are here, uh, Barry McLean and Mary Ann, uh, and uh, I think they deserve an enormous amount of credit, along with uh, Dorothy Jean, who is Barry's uh, late mother, who had the vision that this was going to be an important um, area of uh, investigation and had uh, a wonderful relationship with Mark, and uh, one can see the results. So this is a milestone now because uh, this is the first year that the McLean Center Prize in Clinical Ethics and Health Outcomes uh, will be uh, awarded, and it's a significant prize. It uh, comes with a $50,000 cash award. Um, and uh, this is uh, the biggest uh, prize in medical ethics. Um, Barry uh, and Mark worked this out, and Barry was going to uh, put up the money, and uh, one of his close friends and colleagues of all of us, Jim Frank, who's uh, a member of the uh, Medical Center and University Board, a, a colleague of Barry's on the board, uh, when he heard about this, insisted on... Uh, donating half of the uh, funds towards the prize. So uh, you continue to inspire people uh, to get involved in medical ethics, and uh, I think this is a wonderful outcome. So it's particularly pleasurable uh, to be able to present this to John Wenberg. And uh, John, as I think all of you know, is the pioneer, in fact, developed uh, the use of epidemiologic data to study patterns of healthcare delivery and health outcomes. So this uh, approach has really had an absolutely profound effect on our understanding of the healthcare system. So he's the creator and founding editor of the Dartmouth Atlas of Healthcare, uh, and what the Atlas showed, uh, and I think again you're all aware of, is that there were striking differences in the amount of healthcare uh, in different parts of the country, and even in geographically uh, closely located areas of the country. And what was really uh, very surprising and counterintuitive was that the outcomes uh, which were then studied did not uh, correlate with the amount of money that was spent or the amount of care that was delivered. And in fact, in many cases, there was an inverse relationship. So this has obviously had a profound effect on our uh, thinking about healthcare delivery. Uh, uh, Dr. Wenberg uh, is the uh, Peggy Y. Thompson Professor Emeritus for the Evaluative Clinical Sciences at uh, Dartmouth Medical School. He received his MD from McGill and a Master of Public Health from Johns Hopkins. Uh, he founded the Center for the Evaluated, Evaluative Clinical Sciences in 1988, and that center has really uh, been an enormous uh, locus at which uh, outstanding people have congregated under his mentorship, uh, they've developed their careers there, and I think the collective impact that they have had uh, on our understanding of healthcare delivery and the healthcare system uh, has been uh, really profound. Uh, Dr. Wenberg has received many honors uh, and uh, recognitions. He's a member of the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences. 
He's published hundreds of scholarly papers. Uh, he's received numerous prestigious awards from the Institute of Medicine, from the Joint Commission, from the American Heart Association. And healthcare affairs, or health affairs, uh, chose him to be the most influential health policy researcher of the past quarter century. So I think that's certainly, uh, I would agree with that analysis. So it's my very great pleasure to ask him to come to the podium uh, and to welcome him as the uh, first recipient of this award. He's going to deliver a lecture entitled The Importance of Patient Preferences in Shared Decision-Making in American Medicine. John. start by, by saying how profoundly thankful I am for, for this honor, and I accept it not just personally, but in name of the people that I've been working with for so many years over at Dartmouth, because uh, this is a contribution that no one could have done by themselves. It's, it's a huge team we have, and I'm extremely appreciative of that. And I need to thank Barry and Marianne. Thank you so much for all your friendship over the years and, and for this very nice award. Mark and Anna and all of you in the audience, thank you. Um, I don't know what you do when you get paid so much to give a lecture, you get nervous. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's, that's one of the few times I've gotten nervous because this topic is, I know it pretty well, but. <laughs> so I wrote a, kind of wrote it out just in case, but uh, I'm not very good at reading, uh, so I'll have to make sure I get everything set. But, but basically, I wanted to start um, uh, with, with the, the kind of historical analysis of what I think is happening to the doctor-patient relationship. It would build on the conversation that, that Paul, uh, you had yesterday. Uh, basically, uh, the way I saw the changes that are coming about was the, the, the major assault on the idea of agency that was behind the neoclassical model in which it was deemed rational to delegate, delegate decision-making to physicians. We all grew up that way, and we still, many of us, live in that, in that heritage. But uh, the idea that uh, physicians uh, understand the science of medicine and are able to diagnose patient preferences uh, was sort of fundamental to the idea that it was rational to delegate decision-making. And the assumption, quite reasonably, was that patients don't know uh, that there's an asymmetry of information and so forth. Now, the agency model uh, was important not only for the patient, but it was also important for society because it, society generally assumed that it, it, the, the rational agency model, i.e., the, the, the interpretation of medical need and patient preferences from the physicians, uh, would be based uh, on knowledge and would set a limit, basically, to demand. Because uh, if uh, services were provided at a rate that was above what was deemed to be necessary, that utilization would drop. And models were set in place to um, patrol the market to make sure that deviant behavior didn't get in the way, so we had utilization review. But all the time we had the assumption that more was better uh, and because if it was demanded, because it was demanded by physicians who knew the scientific basis of medicine and, importantly, could di accurately diagnose patient preferences. The, the practice variation phenomenon, uh, which I've been working on for so many years, essentially uh, challenged uh, the notion that uh, science was driving uh, utilization uh, and that patient preferences were driving utilization by, because of the enormous differences that existed between communities to all intents and purposes looked identical. You may remember some of the studies we did with Boston New Haven comparisons. Uh, year in and year out, New Haven, uh, or Boston, exceeded the rates in, of New, in New Haven by about 60%. Now, mind you, those rate differences, those differences in utilizations, were toward a very specific subset of the population, namely those with chronic illness and acute medical conditions. 
So the variation that we've been looking at in terms of spending and in terms of, uh, uh, of um, uh, uh, between regions uh, is explained almost entirely by the differences in, in the intensity with which uh, um, uh, chronically ill is managed, Ill illness is managed. Surgical variability is very idiosyncratic. Uh, and uh, it's um, uh, gotten to the point where what we basically have identified as surgical signatures. One re a region will be high on one procedure, low on another. Now, it's in the area of uh, a discretionary surgery where I think the clearest uh, evidence comes forward uh, of the advantages of shared decision making, not only as an ethical model, but also as an economic model for modulating uh, the uh, utilization rates. And I wanna go through uh, today, uh, just briefly, um, uh, if I can, uh, describing uh, the contribution to this debate that our group worked on so long in terms of trying to rationalize the practice variation phenomenon through outcomes research and ultimately uh, through uh, engagement of the patient in shared decision making. It was this, this sequence of, of research carried over about a 10 year period of time beginning uh, in the mid 70s through actually 15 years through the 90s that, that led not only to the rationalization and understanding of why people were doing operations, the, re the theoretical reason and the practical reason for it, uh, but also uh, to the uh, establishment of the first evidence that engagement of the patients could actually get you close to understanding what the right rate was, you know, the rate of procedures that would happen when patients were informed uh, and were uh, encouraged to take choices that were based on an understanding of their own preferences. Uh, and this in turn led to the uh, formation of the Foundation for Informed Medical Decision Making, which has become uh, at least one strategy for codifying uh, medical evidence and presenting scenarios that would allow patients to engage themselves uh, into, into shared decision making. Um, so let me start with, uh, with uh, uh, the surgical issue. Uh, and I say it's, it's, we use this phrase of learning what works and what patients want. And basically, it's a story that is uh, engaged not only uh, researchers, but also professional, profession, uh, professional leaders. And without Dan Hanley, who was the editor of the Maine Medical Journal uh, in the mid-70s and on, on through the uh, uh, early 80s, this project would have never happened. And I suspect I wouldn't be here today talking to you about shared decision making. Uh, Dan was not only uh, editor of the main medical journal, he was also the, uh, the leader uh, of the um, uh, uh, profession in Maine. He was the secretary of the Maine Medical Association, co college physician at Bowdoin College, and a member of the U.S. Olympic Committee. Very well respected, and Dan took it upon himself to publish our data in the Maine Medical Journal. And this is uh, the only real data shop, well, not quite, but mostly I'm not gonna be talking much about data, but this is that classic problem of a surgical signature. Each one of those colored bars, for example, concentrate on, on the uh, uh, purple one, uh, which is uh, prostatectomy for benign prostatic hyperplasia in large prostate. You'll see in Portland, the rates were about 40% higher than the uh, state average. Uh, in Lewiston, they were about 5% higher, and in Augusta, they were 23% uh, below the state average. And it was this clustering pattern of variation that uh, got the attention of the physicians in Maine and led uh, over a 10-year period to uh, both uh, a project of outcomes research and then ultimately a, a project in which we, uh, uh, as, as a result of that research, it was the, the in, in informing of patients about their treatment options. So in the very beginning, uh, in the first article that we published, we said that in some parts of Maine, 15% of men were receiving uh, prostate surgery by age 85, and others 70% were. And this was basically the, the, the information that caught the attention of, uh, of, of, of the uh, prof profession. And Dan Hanley arranged uh, uh, to, um, to, to recruit specialists to come to Dartmouth Monary Center, 
uh, where we sat watching the beautiful loons and the beautiful scenery out there. And uh, after about five hours in which, or four, three or four hours after which I was catching a lot of hell from these guys about what rates were and what are you really talking about, suddenly they started arguing among themselves about what, why we're doing this. And so we would have urologists from one community next to another uh, discussing it. And what it, what it turned out uh, to be was that they had a, a conflict of opinion uh, that um, said that some of the urologists believed that they op were operating on men uh, in order to make them live longer. Because if you don't take the, the, this, this growing prostate out, you'll get bladder uh, decompensation and renal failure. And this was actually the majority of opinion at that point in time. Uh, we called it the preventive theory of surgery. And there's a lot of uh, uh, other kinds of procedures that are like, like silent gallstones and so forth. But others believed that they were doing it in order to make the quality of life better. They did not believe that the natural history of untreated BPH, benign prostatic hyperplasia, was sufficient uh, 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 to uh, warrant the, the inoculation, so to speak, of the population in order to take out everybody's, everybody's prostate. They did it in order to make people feel better, or to pee better, as we used to say. Now, the, uh, at, at the time that we started this, uh, this was a delegated decision <coughs> To, uh, in which the, the patient relied on the doctor's uh, interpretation of medical evidence and the interpretation of the patient's preferences. Uh, and it was made under the, on the assumption that urine flow indicated need. The irony of this time was it didn't really matter what your theory was, whether you were a quality of life man or a preventive doc. Uh, what you all did was you basically figured out how many urine, uh, how much cc's of urine you could pee into the into a test tube in a minute, and that was sort of your parameter for doing this. It was a very reductionist kind of point of view. Now, by the time we finished um, uh, our studies 15 years later, uh, we had shown through a variety of different uh, approaches using claims data, using decision analysis, uh, using um, the actuarial data from the census, uh, that there was no way the preventive theory was really going to work. Uh, it, it, every way you cut the data, uh, you never made up for the, for the bad effects or the, the mortal, mortality associated with the initial surgical procedure and any uh, reasonable assumption about extension of life expectancy. Uh, but by definition then, if there was anything going on, it was the quality of life theory that had to hold. And in this case, we uh, conducted a prospective uh, evaluation of uh, all the people in, uh, in Maine who were using the urologists to that state, uh, and without a clinical trial, we could show a slam-bang effect on symptoms. There's no doubt about the fact that this procedure was making people pee better from the point of view of their, of their, of their quality of life. Uh, but however, uh, it was quite clear uh, that there were trade-offs, uh, and those trade-offs were uh, differences between uh, symptom improvement and concern about impotence and incontinence. So we had a real trade-off kind of situation. And this was what then led us basically uh, to uh, declare, I guess is right, that the, that the proper understanding of the theoretical reasons for doing this uh, uh, is that it, it, it improves the quality of life, but it does so uh, by concentrating on the quality of urination uh, at the expense of the quality of sexual performance. So clearly that was a trade-off and it was very interesting once we framed it that way and until this day we haven't had a lot of debate among men about whether this is the right way to view this uh, this procedure. Uh, so if popularity in, in, in uh, you know ever uh, sanctions science that well, this is a pretty good viewpoint. Uh, but what were, what were we going to do about it? That was the real question. Uh, we, we could see clear, clearly that preferences uh, can't be diagnosed uh, based on medical history, physical exam, laboratory test, or urine flow. In fact, one of the most interesting studies, I thought, at least I thought we did, was we, when we finally got to the point where we understood what was going on and we had a, a, a way of categorizing symptoms, we could show basically that there was no correlation between urine flow uh, and symptoms, uh, which you know, said, wow, how crazy was this, this whole idea that was initially out there, you know. So, 
So that was where we basically said that shared decision making was the key to learning which rate is right because engagement of the patient in the decision uh, was the only way to understand what demand was at the micro level. Uh, and that's what led us basically to this whole idea of shared decision making. And I, and I want to show you just, am I doing okay on time? Yeah, I just want to show you uh, briefly uh, a five minute clip of the first uh, decision aid that we developed, which this was done in 1987, 88. Uh, Dr. Margolis was the uh, chair of the Department of Pathology and uh, Tom Almy was a chair of the Department of Medicine. And we recruited them to be our, our, our storytellers because we felt that if, if doctors could visibly disagree on, on what they wanted, then patients would be empowered also to get engaged. And, and that turned out, I think, to be a fairly realistic strategy. Uh, but we went on, uh, we were very optimistic at that time that the federal in, in investment in outcomes research through the Agency of Healthcare Policy and Research was going to fund the basic uh, analyses that we had done as the patient outcomes research team. And what was left was uh, to, to design a, a strategy for assuring that the results of these uh, assessments, all of which were devoted, most of which were devoted to surgery, uh, could be translated into patient decision uh, tools. And that led us to for form the Foundation for Informed Medical Decision Making, uh, which to this day has uh, still uh, 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 doing this role. Uh, and uh, uh, so, so there, there is uh, pr probably what was most important about, about this strategy was that we could codify the, the way of, of assessing the uh, science in a reproducible way using uh, decision analysis and using other forms of um, putting what few clinical trials there were together and so forth so that we got the science right, and today the foundation has a network throughout the country, maybe some of you in the room here are associated with it, uh, doing the assessments. And then the next part is, is creating the, the scenarios of, 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 of choice, I guess you could call it, uh, which are the, are the ways of conveying the information to patients. The, uh, in a way, I think this kind of research opens up all sorts of new avenues for health services research particularly in communication, framing effects, other issues associated, how, how does one make certain that patient preferences are served by this kind of work? Uh, and that was one of the, the, the interesting things uh, that we were able to find. We were able to do one important study in uh, group health in Seattle and Kaiser in Denver, in which the entire uh, population of those two uh, staff model HMOs who had BPH were shown the videos. Uh, and that allowed us to look at the formal question about when patients are, are informed, uh, what is the demand for surgery in a defined population, uh, which was the intrinsic question that the practice variations were, were, were raising. And here you'll see uh, on, the, on the far side over there, the blue dots are the national distribution of transurethral prostatectomy surgical procedures at the time we were doing this. You can see the HMO rate prior to the introduction of shared decision making was in the bottom third. By the time we had gotten all the patients informed, the rate had dropped to the very bottom of the national distribution in terms of TERP rates, suggesting that uh, in most parts of the country, the amount, believing this benchmark, that most parts of the country were providing more surgery than informed patients wanted. Uh, and that raised the whole ethical question, basically, uh, uh, of operating on the wrong patient as opposed to the wrong leg. Uh, we think operating on the wrong patient has an imperative in, in ethics that has yet to be fully expressed and I, I hope I can, anyway. So, but were the, how were, were the decisions better? That's the real question. And, and what we could show with a simple questionnaire uh, was that the people that were using the decision aids were much better informed about the natural history of untreated BPH and about the relevant treatment options and the outcomes as far as we could judge them. So the knowledge part of this was uh, superior quite simply by a few, a few uh, can be ascertained with a few questions. The concordance between patient values and care received was another question. And here we could show 
uh, because we were able to measure uh, the degree of botheredness by symptoms, and we were able to, degree, uh, to, to measure the degree to which patients were concerned about impotence and other down, downside risks of this procedure, we were able to show that patients who really were concerned about their, sim their symptoms and bothered by them and didn't care much about sex were much, much more likely to choose uh, to have surgery than uh, the average, five times more likely than people who were at the other end of the spectrum. So we could see a concordance between patient values and care received that gave us confidence that we were dealing here not just with an interesting movie, but with something which was making a huge difference potentially in the lives of patients. So, so that, that kind of, and, and here, here are the other conditions that for which mostly, in fact all on this list, uh, are uh, the kinds of decisions for which patient preferences uh, based on knowledgeable decision making is absolutely key to rational choice. Uh, and uh, they make up, these here make up about 25% of Medicare spending, if you, uh, yeah, or maybe a little less because I think there's a couple missing. But anyway, it gives you a sense it's a pretty big, big chunk of the action. Uh, and here is where I believe we can create, I, I sometimes use the word islands of rationality, where through outcomes research and engagement of patients, we actually can be somewhat certain that our, 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 our ethical requirements uh, of informed patient choice uh, and our economic concerns uh, that we do not waste resources by operating on people who don't want something uh, can, can be realized. Uh, and I, th I think that slowly and slowly there is a, there's a growing sense of that being a reality. It actually entered into the, a few of the pieces of the Accountable Care Act and so forth. But I, I, I really do believe that the, that the political will to complete this, this transition from classic de de uh, delegated decision making to inform patient choice is going to take more leadership and more academic medical centers need to really take seriously the fact that this is their responsibility. Now, this thing gets limited. I'm just going to go over here. Now, there's, there's a significant limits to what, uh, uh, what outcomes research and shared decision making can, be, can, can accomplish. Uh, and that's because of the... Uh, the fact that most care is not, as we say, preference sensitive in the, in the direct way that I've been talking about in terms of the surgical procedures, but rather it's very sensitive to the supply of resources. And a lot of it is subliminal behavior. You don't know what's happening because you don't know, there's no signals coming up from the market to tell you that. And, and here's where uh, the end of life care issue uh, and the the disequilibrium in the market become joined. That theories are, in, in, in everything I look at, particularly in the supply sensitive side, are always in equilibrium with supply. We always know why we should do something in order to use up what we've got. And that's just a truism in medicine. Uh, and that basically creates a downward pressure on practice style. Now, what do I mean by this? Well, basically, let's say that we're talking about the frequency with which cardiologists visit their patients. You have twice as many cardiologists per capita in a market, uh, you are going to basically get twice as many visits to cardiologists in a market. Because cardiologists always work 45 hours a week or more or less, and they're pushed to it by their managers these days sometimes. Uh, and basically, uh, they achieve this by having the interval between revisits. It's not that they can generate more patients with cardiac disease, although there's a little bit of that going on but mostly it's the frequency with, uh, with which uh, they, they next schedule. And you can see why that would be the case because you always ask the nurse to schedule the patient and she'll schedule the patient that's sicker, quicker, uh, but there'll always be a, 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 a queue basically that's, that's waiting for you. Uh, and the same is true uh, in, in, in character or in analogy with uh, hospital beds and other forms of things. And this has a huge impact uh, on uh, the rate of admission to hospital for medical admissions. Here I've simply have looked at the acute care hospital bed supply on the horizontal axis and the discharge rates. Now, I always put hip fractures up here because hip fractures do not, are not budged by supply. Hip, hip fractures are one of the few things in medicine which obey the classic paradigm that illness and patient, uh, physician consensus and what we should do drives utilization. 
because patients with hip fractures always go to the doctor, almost always gets diagnosed right, almost always gets admitted to the hospital, so therefore the hospitalization rate is in fact a surrogate for the incidence rate, and that's what we're seeing here, but not so for medical conditions. And here's where the, the issue gets down into the whole question about end-of-life care. Uh, and what I've done here is I put the percent of deaths associated with an admission to ICU during, among patients that are uh, assigned by, by pattern of practice to selected academic medical centers. So of all the patients that use uh, UCLA Medical Center and have chronic illness, 38% of them end up dying in association with intensive care unit. We don't know if they died in it, but we know they died in the hospital when they, had, when they were in it. Uh, and you go all the way down the scale to Dartmouth-Hitchcock, which is only 17%. And you see in between are all sorts of varieties of medical practice. And remember, this is where our whole end of life care uh, emphasis in ethics is trying to, trying to basically get in here and change this pattern of practice. I just thought you might be interested in the University of Chicago, how they stand. Uh, by the way, the, the, green, the, the green dots here are all the uh, academic medical centers that have medical schools associated with them. I, I failed to say that. And you see there's quite a bit of variation within, within, uh, 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 within Chicago. Uh, but um, uh, but, but here, here's the slide that I wanted to concentrate on. Basically, the support study Many, I think most of you in this, in this room are probably familiar with that study. It was a very extensive effort to intervene in end-of-life care to rationalize the clinical pathways, the word that I like to use, uh, and uh, it failed. It failed basically uh, because patients that had preferences to die in hospital ended up dying at home and vice versa, and it was generally considered that all this effort to redesign the clinical pathways uh, wasn't working in the way the patients wanted. We reanalyzed this data uh, to, sh to, 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 to look at the correlation between the percent dying in hospital in the support trial and the uh, general pattern of hospitalization in the region in which those hospitals were located. And you can see the red dots basically say that what really matters in terms of, 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 uh, of, your, of your likely of dying in the hospital is not the rationalization of the clinical pathway, at least in this study, uh, it's the capacity of the system in which you are, are, are living. Uh, so that, that is then the, the, the background in which, which we need to go to, to see the union between our interest in shared decision making and improving the patient experience and what do we do about the capacity of the system. Uh, and that's uh, sort of held in this little diagram. I, it, I, I won't try to get into it in any, but what we've done is we've taken people in the end-of-life care phase, and we followed them back for five years at these different regions, these different hospitals, and the intensity of care in the last six months of life correlates with the intensive care in all previous six-month periods of life as far back as we've gone. So this is a system-level problem, and it's a problem that if we're going to get at it and if we're going to deal with the cost containment issues, We've got to somehow link our strategies for reform of the doctor-patient relationship to strategies for reforming the intensity of investment that's going on in terms of overall population uh, services. And unfortunately, uh, the focus here has to be on efficiency and lack thereof at the acute hospitals. Uh, and I want to say that uh, in, in sort of closing here, this is the kind of goals of health reform that come out of the Dartmouth Atlas work, and uh, I've taken this from my new book that's, that basically traces this kind of story I've been telling you about, and basically we need to establish informed choice as a standard of practice, and this is another way of, of uh, another mask for shared decision making. I, I sometimes prefer the term informed patient choice because it, it sounds like a, like a legal principle as well as an ethical principle. And shared decision making, other, there's more than one way perhaps of making good choices than uh, 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 not just shared decision making. We need to improve the science of healthcare delivery. We, we simply have to invest in the kinds of work that allow you to continually evaluate the new theories and convert them into information that patients can understand and policymakers can understand and doctors can understand. And, and that's one of my great 
disappointments in my career has been all the work that went into the original patient outcomes research teams and the efforts we made with George Mitchell and David Dernberger and others to get the agency real care policy of research established. Suddenly it just disappeared and it disappeared after the Republicans came in in 1994. Uh, because orthopedic surgeons, or actually it was neurosurgeons, didn't like the results of our back surgery findings. So this stuff is really weak, and we need support, we need efforts, we need commitment. Uh, I'm sure that if the academic medical centers at that time had stood up and said, this is un unreasonable, we can't abandon this program, it wouldn't have been. But we had no support, basically, from, from the mainstream uh, science at that time. Three, we need to promote organized care. There's no question that empirically, at least, uh, places like, uh, like um, uh, Mayo Clinic, uh, Hitchcock, uh, uh, places that are, are large group practices generally do much better uh, than other places do in terms of resource use, even though I'm not quite sure I understand why that's the case. And so academic medical centers that have uh, gotten to the point where they at least have salaried staff have a special opportunity, I think, to move towards organized care, which means long-term follow-up of patients and other things. But finally, we need to constrain the undisciplined uh, growth uh, in capacity and, 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 and spending. Uh, and, and that means we have to figure out when is enough enough and how do we make it happen that, that, um, uh, um, that we don't basically bankrupt the system as we make it more efficient. There's not much in the, in the American, in the uh, Accountable Care Organization, I'm sorry, in the uh, account, Accountable, what is it, the ACA legislation that helps here. The, the one possible thing is the, is the Accountable Care Organizations with shared savings, which mean that if, if uh, academic institutions, for example, that are on the high side and, and come to agreement that benchmarks from the more, their more efficient, efficient brethren are reasonable, uh, the costs of, uh, or, or, or the loss of revenue associated with a decline in inpatient capacity uh, can uh, somehow um, offset, uh, offset the, the loss. Uh, ultimately, however, uh, I, I'm pretty sure that what we're all going to find if we keep going this way and if we keep finding greater and greater pressure on, on, on inpatient uh, facilities, that the bond market uh, and the equity markets are going to collapse. Uh, and we'll find ourselves uh, rowing someplace else. Uh, but my hope is that we still have time, and I'm echoing some of the com conversations that was made yesterday uh, by Arthur, uh, that we still have time to take the steps. And I do believe we have the information we need uh, to do this. We don't have to do more research. We need to do more action. And again, let me, let me thank you. I, I, I really feel honored by this, and uh, it's, it's such a great gathering here, and I, it's been a great privilege for me to be able to come over here on occasion, uh, and uh, uh, thank you all very much, and especially Mary and Marianne, and thank you. Thank you. I think you can all see that Dr. Weinberg was a spectacular choice to be the first recipient of this award. There is time for some questions, we, um, so why don't we try and do that? Actually, I have a question. So you put up the um, on your slide there, number two, so improve the science. Um, so obviously I'm in favor of improving science, but I just wondered whether you believe, and you sort of implied maybe not, that uh, it's lack of science and maybe data that's the rate limiting step. But it, it seems that we do have an enormous amount of data. What, what we probably don't have is enough data at the local level for each physician practice, for even for hospitals. So I just wondered you know, what you think, how you translate these ideas into policy changes and action changes, you know, like at the University of Chicago Medical Center. Well, I, I, you know, I think that uh, the, the science basically um, I'm talking about is delivery science, how much resources do we need to manage chronically ill patients? And what is the optimal, well, I'm not gonna use the word optimal, because, but I'm gonna, what is the satisfying best strategy for doing that? And here, here for example, I would point to the work of, uh, of Intermountain Healthcare uh, and Brent James, 
uh, where they have spent a lot of effort rationalizing the relationship between primary care physicians and specialists in managing chronic illness over time and shown uh, uh, remarkable results in terms of improvements in quality measures, but also uh, in some observational studies and some randomized trials, uh, actual uh, outcomes of care being better. So that's what I'm talking about, because our biomedical science is fine. It's the translation into clinical practice that has been neglected so much. And yet that's, that's the point where all that's cost and all the sparks and all the energy arise right now. Yeah. Um, Lynn Jansen, OHSU. Your um, talk was very interesting. You focused on um, the cases where um, informed choice actually led to some savings in, in healthcare dollars. Um, but I wondered if um, it might also be the case that um, establishing informed choice in the context where you give patients uh, more options to choose from and then they choose, you know, the more expensive options, um, it might also lead to increased costs, thereby putting um, goal one and goal four on the slide up there in, in some conflict. The choice of, of discretionary surgery versus other options for the same condition um, sorts out people's attitudes toward risk pretty quickly. And I think patients generally are more risk averse about invasive treatments than clinicians. So we can expect uh, that to happen. Uh, the, the interesting thing is that once we've clarified that the purposes of treatment X is to improve the quality of life and patients have different attitudes about whether they would like it or not, there's really no strong ethical argument why we should provide the more expensive treatment without differential co-payments. Uh, and uh, if society doesn't like the uh, distribution uh, of, or, or, or the effect on spending of information about, uh, about treatment options with no co-payments or a small one, uh, then the, it, you can always adjust preferences by getting a little more skin in the game, as they say. Uh, and I, I think that's one way of answering your challenge. It will not work, however, for, in my opinion, for the chronically ill patients, because it's very hard to, to have an incentive not to see your doctor when he told you to come back, uh, you know, or not to be hospitalized when you're pretty sick and there's a bed there. So, so I, I, I think that for the preference side of the equation, uh, we, we do have other tools that policymakers could use if, if we get in a situation where things to be, to get to be too expensive. And by the way, once you introduce that kind of a modulation on demand, the prices will go down for sure in the more expensive ones, very likely anyway. Hi, I'm Lexi Torgi from Indiana. I really appreciate sort of the, the story you tell of how um, for elective surgeries you started with this great degree of disparities in, um, in provision of care to um, better data and a shared decision-making model that relied on um, decision tools. And I wonder if you think the way forward for end-of-life care is similar. I mean, you identify sort of a similar pattern of um, kind of these, these great disparities in how care is provided. And, and I'm struggling as a clinician to think about how I might apply the same strategies of shared decision making um, with patients who are facing the end of life um, in order to, to kind of optimize care. Yeah, I, I, I really do believe um, that we can do that. Um, but I wanted to make sure that people understand that if we do it for patient X and Y, but not for alpha and beta or whatever, uh, the, the guys that aren't getting it are probably gonna end up with even greater exposure to the care intensity at, 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 at during their life, basically. So, so it's, it's a threshold effect that affects the entire patient population that has to be kept in mind. And then there's the individual patient flow through the system for which your decision making certainly will protect some of them uh, or put this way, should, should, should end up in choices that reflect their preferences. Uh, I think, I mean, we know you can do that. Uh, you can affect preferences by scenarios around end of life care. Whether you could implement those preferences, both for them and also take advantage of the reduced in demand that, that's associated with that is another question. Michael Massal, University of Chicago. Um, I was intrigued with your initial studies where you 
demonstrated almost that what we thought would be a reliable uh, biomarker, urine flow, would correlate with disease severity. And I was also impressed that when you chose the physicians to describe the scenarios, you were looking at both context and giving permission and quality of life. But the third rail in the American health system is disability and the patterns of care when we become more dependent and more disabled. And most of us as a value would not send a pet orangutan to the average American nursing home. And so therefore, how could you comment on how this fits into that model and the fears that especially vulnerable populations have with respect to disability? I'm, I'm not sure that I, I, I this, this may not work, but um, what we're talking about in terms of this elective surgery is a different category of care than what you're talking about in the sense that, w it w I mean, we would probably not want to operate on a, you know, a nursing home patient that had a very short life expectancy, even though they may have some overflow urinary incontinence or something like that. Um, but, but the disability issue, um, isn't, isn't that a problem? Uh, give me another example. Uh, what you well, my, my reason was to your model of shared decision-making mm -hmm. in dealing with uncertainty mm -hmm. depends on informed preferences, context, and choices. Exactly. And all I wanted to do uh -huh. is extend because aside from elective surgery, you kind of suggested that in dealing with both chronic diseases and complex choices, that there is value to conceptualize and extend the model. That's why I brought yeah. the disability question. Right. I, I actually, I, I'm not sure that I can, can answer that other than to say that, that um, in, in, the, in, the, in the vast uh, sea of uncertainty that we're talking about here in chronic illness, failure to have rationalized even the relationships between provider A and provider B and what the trajectory of care should be and be able to compare that to other places that are trying to do the same thing create such a, a vacuum of knowledge that, that uh, we, we really don't know what to do in terms of specific interventions. End of life care has the interesting part about it because you have hospice option at some point when death seems inevitable. But I've been trying to say that even though we might make some people's uh, final days correspond more to their preferences by shared decision making, unless we can affect the overall intensity of care, it's likely to be very unlikely. It will not, first of all, save costs, which is an issue. But secondly, uh, since we never know when someone's going to die, it, it's going to be very difficult to do, to do that in any kind of a systematic way. I think um, we probably should end now, otherwise there'll be no time for the break. So, sorry, maybe you can speak to Dr. Weinberg uh, over some coffee. So, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you all.